Good morning. This is Pastor Sam. I'm not supposed to be on, and certainly not at this hour. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, um, we will not have our usual 11 o'clock morning devotions because I have a commitment with my son. But uh, I squeezed in maybe about half an hour's worth of teaching so I wouldn't fall behind on this tremendous subject called the reconciling community. And uh, so I just wanted to uh, share with you all, um, share with you all the, the teaching that I prepared. Uh, we, we, will go, we will go very quickly through this so that I can uh, go and pick him up at his job and then take him to his appointment. Um, I hope you, you do understand. Okay, God bless you all, and uh, let us pray. Father in heaven, I thank you, Lord, for this day. And I pray, O oh God, that in the short time that I will be able to share your word, that it will inspire and strengthen our resolve to become the reconciling community. Uh, Lord, we are sinners saved by grace, and, and that faith in Jesus Christ has afforded us mercies that we don't deserve we never merit but by your amazing love you've extended to us and may we also extend it in the same manner we who have freely received mercy and grace we ask you O oh god to help us to offer it freely as well i pray for those that are ill right now our brother nelson our lord is battling COVID. Um, there are a few others, O oh Lord, who have been testing positive with COVID. And so we pray, O oh God, that they will recover quickly. We're grateful, O oh God, that, that so far the, those who have tested positive, the symptoms have been mild enough so that they can recover at home. We pray, O oh God, that you help them recover quickly without any lasting damage. We pray for those, O oh God, who are receiving chemotherapy. May you protect them from this horrible virus. And we pray, O oh God, that they will continue to improve, O oh Lord. We ask you, O oh God, to extend your healing hand to those that are sick. And we ask, O oh God, that you would be with us even in this morning. We ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Eddie Kirkland. You're, you're the only one on so far that I could see. And uh, it, it, it's so much easier to know that I'm at least talking to one. This will be on the page. So those that um, who will want to come around later on and watch it, you can. We've been talking about the, um, the reconciling community, you know, the good and beautiful, the good and beautiful uh, community, uh, which is uh, a very, very, uh, let's say, I'm just setting up everything here. A very, very important um, a lesson, and it's very challenging to us. So I, I just want to uh, say that. Okay, so I see that Ronnie's on. God bless you, Ronnie. Thank you for coming on, Ronnie. Makes it easier for me to, to teach. I'm going to be teaching maybe for 20, 25 minutes. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, I was not going to be on, and I cannot be on at 11 o'clock. By 11 o'clock, I have to be uh, picking up Joseph at his job and taking him to a very important appointment. So um, I, I pray that um, you would understand. But what I did was uh, prepare slides very early this morning so I could share it very quickly with you. So let's go right to it. We've prayed and we've asked the Lord to, to bless us this morning. And I welcome you to our Wednesday morning devotions here on the 29th day of June, the very next to last day. Uh, of June. I remind all of you, especially those of you who are residents in our district and in our area, uh, 10475, especially in the um, Throgs Neck, Co-op City, and City Island area, uh, we will be holding tomorrow night at 7 o'clock uh, our Build a Block with the 45th Precinct. It's our meeting. Every three Every three months, we meet with the 45th Precinct to discuss safety and security measures uh, that are implemented in our area, and also to give you a voice so that you can express your concerns to the police department. 
And so uh, we welcome you. You can register at the door. Uh, you don't have to call in advance. And we ask you to please participate and show up because this is, a, this is how we build our community. Well, very well, we, we're continuing on our, our theme, which is the, um, the good and beautiful community. And in the chapter that we started yesterday, the reconciling community, we talked about um, forgiveness and reconciliation. And when we talk about reconciliation, we're really talking about removing that which separates two parties. Two entities are separated because there's a block in between. That block is usually an offense, some hurt, some wound that separates us from really engaging each other and loving each other in a God-honoring way. And so we are called to be the community that reconciles. We are called to be the peacemakers. We who have received so much love and forgiveness ought to extend it to others. And yet it's a very challenging thing to do. So we're going to continue on that um, lesson, and, and we covered the false narrative of, of believing that until you forgive, you cannot be healed, uh, and, and unless um, you, you forgive others, you cannot be forgiven. That is a false narrative. It is, is, it's a narrative that is propelled by humanistic psychology, and um, I, I don't throw out the, the baby with the bathwater. There's a lot that we've learned from psychology and the science of understanding human relations and the way the mind and the the person works. But um, uh, anything that is obtained from science, uh, we believe that if it's true, it came from God, but not, a, not always is it true. And there are different ways of understanding even those truths from God's perspective. And so we went into the the biblical or the true perspective, which is to understand that we don't have the resources in ourselves to to really forgive. We don't we don't have enough strength to overcome the pain uh, of a of a deep wound. And the illustration that um, James Bryan Smith gave yesterday was a young man in his class called Stan, who had been abused by a family friend. Uh, uh, for five years and uh, sexually abused and it led him to a suicidal attempt and uh, interesting because uh, I'm dealing with someone who's struggling with suicidal ideation uh, and um, and that's a very painful thing it, it's it's a sorrowful thing please pray for me as I will attempt to engage that person and try to get them the help that they need but this is what Stan was confronted in when he came to this college professor. Uh, this college professor offered him uh, the gospel. And the gospel tells us that we cannot save ourselves, that we, there isn't anything in us that could really overcome the woundings and, the, and the, the griefs and the losses and the pain and the suffering uh, when, when we are hurt by especially people that we love and, um, and admire. And when that happens, the, the, the wounds are so deep that often it blinds us from any uh, way of recovering. And very often the victims blame themselves and, and find that they cannot, uh, it, it's harder to forgive themselves than even the perpetrator or the abuser. So we talked a lot about that yesterday and how Stan came into a redeeming and loving and forgiving relationship uh, through, through the gospel of Jesus Christ and how when he was fully, truly touched by God's grace, God enabled him and gave him the, the resources to, to share it publicly. And, and that's really hard, especially for a male to confess uh, having been sexually abused uh, repeatedly and repeatedly and repeatedly for five years. And um, not only did he find freedom, but that freedom that he had in sharing it extended to others. And there was a young lady in one of the classes where he was sharing his testimony that also came to be freed because 
it, it, it inspired her so that she took the leap and confessed that she had also been a victim and that it was causing her so much pain. And so when we share our wounding, and especially in the process of recovery, that empowers us. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit, the power of the gospel. And then he got so uh, thrilled with the forgiveness that Jesus offered him that he thought, you know, the, the perpetrator needs to know that he also can be forgiven. And he was bold enough to confront the perpetrator and let him know that he that he forgave him, but the perpetrator was not ready and was totally in denial and uh, broke off all communication with him and uh, rejected. But he was strong enough to say, you know, I, I forgive you, and but I am strong enough now to tell you, you will never take advantage of me again. And he used the metaphor of the caterpillar turning into a butterfly and, and appropriated it to himself. I'm not what I used to be. I'm a new man. I am a butterfly. I am transformed. I have been changed by the power of the gospel. And so that's what we've been talking about as a reconciling community. The church is supposed to be extending that message to a world that is in deep need of forgiveness. And certainly that's something that we are dealing with this morning. This morning we want to continue and we want to go into the Jesus narrative. What does Jesus say specifically about this forgiveness thing? And um, so this is what we're going to be uh, looking at in the next 15 to 20 minutes. If you notice that I'm speaking fast, it's because I'm working against the clock and I have to go pick up Joseph. So be please be uh, patient with me. Uh, turn in your Bibles if you have them. If not, then look very closely to the slide that you have in front of your device from Matthew 18 to 23 to 35. We have a parable that Jesus gives. And in that parable, uh, Jesus shares. And I'm, I'm just going to get rid of my face and put the slide so that you can see it completely. And uh, so in Matthew 18, 23 to 35, Jesus teaches about this possibility of reconciliation and the possibility of forgiveness. And he, and he teaches it in a parable. And it goes like this, Therefore the kingdom of heaven may be compared, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who, who wished to settle accounts with his servants. And that's, you know, when we look at the parables, we, we want to see what Jesus is teaching uh, and, 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 and what he's identifying. The king is God, God the Father. And the, the servants or the slaves who are, are, we are his servants or we are, we are under his authority, but we have unsettled accounts with God. We owe God because we have violated his law and transgressed against his principles. And so God wanted to, or the king wanted to settle his accounts with his servants. And when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And um, that's a lot of money. And since he could not pay it, his master ordered him to be sold. Okay, so uh, the king says, you can't pay this, so you, you're going to have to go into debtor's jail, and you're going to be sold in slavery. And, and, and that's because you don't have enough money to pay. But now, in a little while, I'll tell you what, what 10,000 talents is more or less value in terms of today, but it's between the millions and the billions, so, so be ready for that. And, uh, and since he could not, verse 25, and since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. Not only were they all going to be enslaved, but he would still have to pay it. And, and what it means is that until some form of it was paid, they would not be released from this uh, penalty. And uh, in this case, it was slavery or debtor's jail, uh, and which is often the same thing. Um, and so the servant fell on his knees threw himself at the mercy, imploring him, have patience with me. I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master, that master of that servant released him and forgave the debt. Okay, so the master was owed. The king is God who is um, settling his debts. And this, this debtor had so much that he couldn't pay, and he was going to be sold into slavery and sold into debtor's jail. 
and still have to pay the debt, but not only him, his wife and his children and everything that he had would be removed from him. And, uh, and so he, he uh, and out of pity, out of pity and uh, pity, compassion, love, mercy, grace, generosity, they're all synonyms here, right? He forgave him the debt pardon. That means he doesn't have to go to jail. He doesn't even have to pay it back. That's how great this mercy was. When he begs for forgiveness, it's so great that it covers all his debts. An incredible, incredible mercy. Okay, so the story goes on, but we get into a little bit of the, of the details. 10,000 talents. Well, one talent was equal to 20 years wages. 10,000 talents would be equal to 20,000 years wages. We're talking between, you know, the hundreds of millions and into the billions. That's how much he owed. It's an exorbitant, exorbitant amount. It is so great. And, and that detail is important. As the story continues, as we read the rest of the text, we'll see that this has a very important, it becomes a very important factor to the resolution of the story. And so, we find that the man owed the king into the millions and perhaps even billions, but he can't pay the king, so he begs for mercy, and the king has pity and pardons his debt. That is a, a beautiful thing. You might think that, that someone who had been the recipient of such a great mercy, would, th th would he become himself very gracious and merciful? But that is not the case, which tells us that human beings don't learn from their mistakes and that selfishness is greater than, 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 than the recognition and rec uh, to recognize and to understand that you have been the recipient of such amazing grace. So what happens? The rest of the story is found in, in verses 28 through 35 of Matthew. But when that same servant who had been forgiven went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, which is much less, way less than what he owed. And he seized him and he began to choke him saying, pay what you owe, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. Same words he used. Same words that he used. In verse 30 says, he refused and went and put him in prison or debtor's jail. And, and that's where that man would have to be until he could get somebody to pay his debt for him. Right? Because he can't make money while he's in jail. So he could be there for years and years and years. And, and, and comparatively, he owed so much less. But the man said, you know, I'm not going to have mercy. I'm not going to have pity on you. Even though he had been the recipient of mercy and pity. And uh, when the fellows, when his fellow servants, verse 31, when his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed because they had been there when he threw himself on his knees. Right. And um, and so and they reported it to their master, the master who had pardoned him, um, you know, uh, he's informed now that this guy whom he pardoned um, didn't pay it forward. He, he, he had committed this, this horrendous uh, uh, act of selfishness and put a fellow servant in debtor's jail. When his master uh, heard that, he was greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? The question is rhetorical. The answer is yes. If you have been the recipient of so much mercy, you should extend it to others. That's the principle that Jesus is teaching, that he who has been forgiven much should be ready and able to offer forgiveness because because you have been the beneficiary of mercy and grace. And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay his whole debt, which means he'd be in jail for the rest of his life. He would die in jail. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. And so I think that's the key thing, that there are people who say they forgive, but they don't forgive from their heart, from their whole being. 
They, they, they are uh, people who uh, are expedient when it is when it is expedient and favorable for you to show mercy, you show mercy. But when it is not expedient or favorable, you will not show mercy. And when you're deeply hurt, you show it even less. And that's the problem. So the, the, the story tells us at the heart of what Jesus is trying to say that um, this, this second servant owed what would be the equivalent of a hundred days of labor. So one denarii is equal to one day's pay for labor. For labor, And so a hundred denarii was the equivalent of two, three, three and a half months of pay compared to, to a hundred, uh, yeah, a hundred talents, uh, which is, uh, the equivalent of uh, 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 of millions and even perhaps even billions of dollars. And so the shock of the story is the difference in the amount owed. That's Jesus uses that that extravagant distance between what the first servant was pardoned and what he failed to pardon uh, the other servant who owed him. The, the difference was night and day. Uh, what he owed was more than 600,000 times more than what he was owed. He owed more than 600,000 times more than what the fellow servant had owed him. And yet he could not show mercy. And he would not. The original question, if, if you read these passages out of context, you need to read what goes before. And in Matthew 18, 21, all of this parable is, 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 is an answer that Jesus gives to one of Peter's great questions. Peter asks in verse 21 of the same chapter, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And you know this answer. He says, no, as you know, 70 times seven. In other words, there's no ending. As often as he needs forgiveness, you should offer it. Because as often as you need forgiveness, I will offer it. See, this is the correlation. The way that God treats us is the way we should treat others. And, and so he says, Peter, don't get into, um, you know, uh, spiritual deeds, accounting. Don't get into bookkeeping and how many good things you did. And I was talking to somebody yesterday who said, you know, I, I never get enough credit for this. I never get enough credit for that. Uh, and, and he was reciting the things that he does. And I said, you know, you should do it for no credit because God has given you mercy for no credit at all. And and so it, it, it was very hard to explain to him because the world narrative was still in him. He, he He's a Christian. He received Jesus, but he still ruled and governed by his worldly narrative that, you know, if you do some good, then you should be benefiting some good from it. In other words, you reap what you sow in exact terms. And uh, that is a basic principle that is biblical. But um, when it comes to uh, righteousness, there's nothing that we could do to earn his righteousness. It's, it's impossible. We don't have the resources. We established that at the beginning. Forgiveness is a miracle. You can't do it yourself. No one can really forgive on their own um, because uh, we don't have the resources available to us. And so uh, that's the question that is at hand. And, and so Jesus is answering Peter by telling the story. And God is represented in the parable as the king. We are the indebted servants. Our debt is impossibly great, and we cannot ever pay for it. I can never pay for the forgiveness that I've received when I think of all the things that God has forgiven me. And I have forgotten more than half of the things that I've done that he's forgiven me. And I and I still feel that, that, that it, it, his love is so amazing that I can't put a measure to it. I can't really say, you know, because every day I go to him and I seek his mercy. Every day I repent and I seek his, his generosity, his grace is more than sufficient. He gives more than we need. Uh, that is a powerful thing. And when you think about that, when you really, really think about that, you realize that however the king forgives the debt by way of his mercy, 
And just as God in Christ has forgiven our debts by way of his grace and mercy. And so we who have been the recipients of that mercy and that grace should never, never withhold mercy and grace from someone else who has wounded, hurt, or grieved us. We should be ready and able. We have been forgiven more than we will ever be called to forgive. The Jesus narrative is very simple. You have to remember what the Lord did for you. And when you do, you will not be able to withheld mercy from someone who has wounded you because you are the great beneficiary of mercy and grace. And because of that, if we meditate for a long time on how much God has forgiven us, it will help us forgive others. It will help us forgive others. And, and when Stan understood that young man who had been abused for five years through the word of God after three months in Bible study, after he gave his heart to Jesus Christ, when he understood through the word of God how much God had forgiven him, he then wanted to extend that forgiveness to the abuser. And Stan's personal narrative shifted when he entered the meta-narrative of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When he entered into that narrative, he realized, who am I to judge someone else when I have been the recipient of so much mercy? I, I, I want him to, to know that I forgive him because Jesus forgave me. And uh, that is a powerful motivation. That is a powerful. God in Christ has forgiven me all my sins. Not some, not the worst, but all my sins. Therefore, I can forgive those who hurt me. And uh, that becomes. But note that it was not until Stan came to understand the Jesus narrative that his heart was changed. He couldn't do that before. He had to come to the professor, James Bryan Smith, and he had to enter into this conversation. James Bryan Smith prayed for him. In the process of praying for him, Stan calls on Jesus to come into his heart. When Jesus comes into his heart, he begins to change his heart. And then he makes him, through the Bible studies, in the community of faith. This is why you should always be in Bible study with other people that will hold you accountable. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday mornings, we have these devotionals. On Tuesday night, last night, it was the book of Galatians, not Ephesians. It, the Spanish Bible study that's doing Ephesians. The English one is doing Galatians. So you're still in that wonderful book of Galatians. And, and, um, and, and, and you should be getting deeper and deeper in the knowledge of the grace of God. The Bible says that we should grow in the knowledge of God's grace, of the, of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grow in the knowledge of the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We should be constantly growing. Growing. Why? Because the more we grow in that grace, the more gracious we become. And so it was when Stan understood what, what God's mercy had done for him that he was compelled to offer that mercy to the predator and the abuser. And grace came into his heart and empowered him to do what he could not do before. It's impossible for anyone to forgive the predator, the abuser, unless God gives you that insight, unless God gives you that, that ability, that grace, that power. And so, my friends, that's the uh, lesson for today. I have to get going, and I hope that this will um, be of great help to you. And um, let's, let's see if we can get here. Yeah. Uh, whoops. Let's, uh, let's get this one back in here. There we go. Oops. No, this is what we need. Ah, okay. Thank you so much. I got to get going. I got to go pick up Joey in, in 10 minutes. I got to be there. So um, please forgive me. I hope that this will be a blessing to you. And if you came in late and you can just wait in a few minutes, it'll be up. And you can watch it right on Facebook. I won't have time to send it up to um into YouTube until maybe an hour from now, and then I'll send it up to YouTube because I've, I've got to rush and pick up Joseph. Father, in the precious name of Jesus, I pray, oh God, 
that this this narrative that you've just taught us through this parable uh, will always remind us that your, your forgiveness toward us is daily and daily available to us. Your mercies are new every morning. As the book of Lamentation teaches us, great is thy faithfulness. Uh, you remain faithful even when we're not faithful. And uh, there is therefore no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God. And so, Lord, I pray, O oh God, that every man and woman who would get a chance to listen to this will be reminded of your unconditional love and your forgiveness that is overwhelming. And that that in itself should lead us to really consider just forgiving everyone and anyone who has ever wounded or hurt us. Give us the grace to apply it and make it a reality in our lives. And now I pray, O oh God, that you bless everyone within the earshot of my words. May it be your voice that they hear. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you for listening. Forget about the rest. Jesus is the best. Have a 